Welcome to the CBS Radio Mystery Theater Archives, the only YouTube channel which has the original classic episodes of the CBS Radio Mystery Theater in order with no ads. Thank you for listening, and now, enjoy the show. G. Marshall. What surprise package shall we dig for this time in our Pandora's box of fantasy foibles and farragos? A werewolf baying the moon? A restless ghost trailing icy shivers as he searches for rest? A locked door? A secret panel? A curse from centuries past? Or retribution at last claiming its victim? Or shall we just consider the most fascinating problem of all? A young girl in danger, not only of her life, but her sanity. By heaven, there he is. Where? Down here inside the house. Nerve of a fellow. How'd he escape? Beyond me. Hello there! You! Ted Marshall! No place of hope for you here! Get out! You're trespassing! Get off these grounds or I'll put a pistol ball through you! Harry, he's taken a shot at us. That does it. Our mystery drama, The Covered Bridge, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Jada Rowland. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. I don't suppose any of us who, in traveling, have unexpectedly plunged into a tunnel could have escaped the icy thought, what if I never come out of this darkness? Or more terrifying still, what if when I emerge into the light on the other side, I find myself in a different world than the one I left going in. There is nothing dark or foreboding about the tunnel Ted and Peg Marshall will drive into. It's a simple, short bridge in New Hampshire, different from other bridges only because it is a covered bridge and because what it spans is not just a simple river. But the stream of time. Hey, sleepyhead. Mm-hmm. If I married a zombie. Are, are you with it, Peg? Mm. I'm just cozy and sleepy. Oh, remind me to marry a woman I don't bore the next time. I'm not bored being married. Oh, but there was all that champagne. And it's taking so long. Well, you picked New Hampshire for the honeymoon, and it's only twilight. I just hope we get there soon. Where are we? Uh, I was hoping you wouldn't ask. Why? Are we lost? Well, let's say I'm hoping we find the right turn soon. Uh Uh-oh. Oh, Oh, look what's coming up. A covered bridge. You recognize it? Peg? Peg? Hey, Peg, don't leave me. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up, Marguerite. We're almost home. Time you come back to your senses. In the name of heaven, try to grow up and behave like a woman instead of a silly, love-struck girl without a brain in her head. It's the kind of wild terror that closes up the back of your throat and shuts off your breathing. Like when you half wake from some dreadful nightmare. A moment ago, I was Peg Marshall. A newly married woman driving with my brand new husband to our honeymoon. And while I dozed off, we drove our automobile into a covered bridge and suddenly, shockingly, somewhere on the way across, 
last I find myself in a two-horse carriage with a strange man sitting beside me. As we come out of the roof of the covered bridge on the far side of... into another world. I asked you a question, Marguerite. Who? There is no need to be difficult. You may not know your own mind. Or at least I hope you know your own name. Marguerite is not my name. Oh, really? Since when? It's never been my name. How oh, fascinating. Uh, just what do you consider your own name to be? My name is Peg. Well, if you have to be formal, it's just plain Margaret. Nothing fancy. Well, well, I'm sure your father will be interested to hear that. It wouldn't be much of a surprise since he gave it to me himself. Now, would you mind stopping this contraption and letting me out? Whoever you are. Contraption? Let, let you out? Oh, 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 no, my little bird, not ever again. I don't know what bicentennial parade you're dressed up for, or what kind of joke this is, but I don't think it's funny. Nor do I, my dear Marguerite, or for that matter, your father, as you'll soon find out. We are not amused, either of us. As for your father, I suggest that before you go to him to beg his forgiveness, you get out of that shameful garb or you may kill him with the apoplexy. What shameful garb? Oh, now, what do you consider yourself to be? Portia, the other, Rosalind? Have you some romantic theatrical notion you can avoid pursuit by dressing up as a boy? Look, look, mister... There's, there's some sort of mix-up here. Yes, uh, most assuredly is, and we've had enough play acting, so please stop it immediately. If you must refer to me as Mr., please do me the courtesy of adding my surname. Or call me Theo. This has got to be a bad dream. I should hope what we have lived through the past day will be just that. You've done enough harm to the Drexel name to say nothing The Drexel of... name? What is that? I think I shall leave that to your father to explain. And let us get something quite straight between us, young woman. You will not sully my name. Before I'd permit you to make Theodore Bentley a laughingstock, I'd, I'd as soon take the whip to you as I did to your fancy boy. What fancy boy? Your light of love, Lieutenant Edward Graham. Lieutenant? You mean Ted? My husband? Your would-be husband. What have you done with him? Where, where is Ted? Well, he should quite properly be in the stockade. There's no question that he will be cashiered, reduced to the ranks, and... Wait a minute. I don't make this scene at all. Are you... Are you trying to tell me that my husband, Ted Marshall, is going to get shot at and maybe killed? Nobody is your husband yet, and nobody else is going to become that but me. You will marry me tomorrow, young lady, or by the living God, you and your family will suffer the consequences. I can't talk. I shut my eyes, thinking if I do, and I open them again. This dark stranger in the powdered wig, with a tri-cornered hat, white knee breeches and riding boots will disappear. But even as I do, I know it won't be that easy. Something is out of whack. I'm on a kind of a trip I've never dreamed of. Where am I? In what world? And most important of all, where is Ted, my husband? And then the carriage comes to a halt, and I open my eyes again. There is no miracle. All right, Vinny. You can put the rig away and see to the horses. So, oh, hello, Abigail. Evening, Mr. Bentley, sir. You can help Miss Drexel down and get her out of that ridiculous get-up before her father sees her. Yes, sir. Right away. Oh, come along, Miss Marguerite, dearie. We'll go upstairs and freshen up. Who are you? <laughs> now, don't tell me you'd turn your back on your Abby. Oh, come, dear. It wouldn't do for the rest of the servants to see you the way you are. What are you trying to tell me? Hush, not in front of Mr. Theo. All right, Abigail, I leave her to you. And you make sure she's as respectable as we can get her before she comes down to the table. Wait a minute, I'm not going to... Please, Miss Marguerite, for the love of heaven, don't make any more fuss now. We tried, and we lost. Tried what? Lost what? Inside, lovey. 
We can talk all secret-like as soon as we're in our own little nest. As we went up to the house, I could see that it was a great, massive place of stone and white stucco, laced with great, heavy wooden beams. A place of age and wealth. Abigail, a little bird of a woman, and I went up the stairs to what she called my room. There was a great four-poster bed, two huge armoires for clothes, and a fire burning cheerily in the fireplace. In every way in my fitted blue jeans, boots, and spaced out as I was, I couldn't have felt more out of place. Now, the first thing to do, Miss Marguerite, is to get you out of those clothes. Wherever did you find such outlandish garb? Never mind that for a moment, Abigail. I- is that what I call you? Oh, you know, your whole life it's been plain and simple. Abby. Oh, are you all right, my little love? Yes. No. No, I'm not all right. And I'm not your... Abby, what did you mean when you whispered to me that we tried and we lost? Hush, shh. If the master and that miserable Bentley man were even to suspect that I tried to help you and the lieutenant, I... Help me? Us? Do what? Why, to run away, of course, to get married. What happened, Miss Marguerite? I don't know. Oh, there now. Poor lovey. You're so delicate and sensitive. It's no wonder those two cruel old men have got you half out of your wits. I'm not half out of my wits, Abigail. I'm perfectly sane. The trouble with me is I'm not your Miss Marguerite. I'm someone else. Oh, please, don't hover over me and treat me like some kind of nut. A, a what? A weirdo. Like I'd slipped a peg or gone round the bend or... I... I just mean I am... I am not losing my mind. Will you answer me some questions? Well, of course. First off, my name. You say it's... Marguerite? Oh, but of course. Marguerite what? Drexel? That's right. Marguerite Harkness, Beaulieu, Mayu, Drexel. It's all me? Oh, they're all family names. I see. And I have a father. What's his name? I mean, I don't need all of them, just his first and his last name. Well, his name is Mr. Wainwright Drexel. No mother? Oh, now, what are you trying to do to me, lovey? You know your sweet mother passed away not not six months ago. I'm sorry. I'm truly sorry. Theo Bentley. Who is he? Sir Theo. You know he's here from England on some business with your father's bank and that he asked for and was given your hand and that you're to be married tomorrow. That's what caused all the trouble. Because I was in love with someone else. Oh, that darling boy. Just the husband to care for and comfort you. What happened after we'd arranged everything? What is my darling boy's name? Edward Marshall. Ted? Oh, your name for him. What does he look like? Do you have a snap? I, I mean, a, a photograph of him? I mean, do, well, do I have uh, a... A what? A, a picture. Oh, oh, a painting. No. You remember, you had a miniature of him, but your father took it away from you. Oh, I'm beginning to have a big fat hate for this character. Oh, Marguerite, he's only trying to do what's best for you, according to his lights. One more question. Hmm? What date is it? Why, well, you know, it's March 16th. Yes, Abby, that's one thing I happen to know. But you said something about King George. By the date, I mean... Marguerite! What's this door doing there? Oh, Lord, save us, it's your father. I was just giving Miss Marguerite a sponge bath, sir. Well, well, don't be too long about it. As soon as she's dressed, I want to see that young lady in the library. So that's my father. Big bully. Oh, Miss Marguerite. Never mind him for the moment. What I want to know is what year is it? Oh, why, the year of our good Lord... 1776. So at last, Peg Marshall has to face a stunning, shocking, unbelievable fact. That through the cosmic accident of some time warp, in the tunnel of that covered bridge, somehow, 
she lost not only a brand new husband, but two centuries of her own identity. I'll return shortly with Act Two. on earth would you do if you found yourself in a situation like Peg Marshall's? Can you imagine the frustration, the icy fear, the total helplessness to be surrounded by a group of people from another day and age, every one of whom is a stranger to you and who could only consider you stark raving mad if you insisted that you were a girl who would not even be born for nearly 200 years. Well, let's go back and see how Peg handles it. While I was getting dressed, I tried to concentrate on what to do, which wasn't easy. First of all, I had to pretend to some maidenly modesty to get out of my modern underwear and hide my own clothes under the mattress. Then I started getting into, well, too much. Long linen drawers, a sort of linen vest thing, and then, oh, brother, the corset. Abby pulled that so tight I could hardly breathe. And a harness with a cage of hoops hanging from it. Petticoats and petticoats. And finally, a heavy silk brocade dress. By that time, I'd made up my mind. If you can't fight them, join them. I'd go along with the scene till I figured some way out. There we are. Now you look like your lovely self again. Do I? Oh, yes, Miss Marguerite. <laughs> my poor little thing. Why do you say that? Oh, I, I tried to help, but now that they've stopped your elopement, hey, I... Hey, I take a daddy was in on this, too. Who? Papa? I, I mean, father. Oh, naturally he was. So that's what I call him, father. Of course. No lady of breeding would call her parent anything else. Of course. And uh, he was just as dead set against Ted, I, I mean, the lieutenant, as my intended. Oh, you know that. Although, in the master's defense, I don't think he could quite help himself. In what way? Well, you would know that better than I. Besides, it isn't my place to go mixing in family affairs, I know, but... Oh, please, for both your sakes, don't quarrel again with the master. Well, why should I worry about his point of view? Oh, well, you know how the doctor has warned him not to get excited. We nearly lost him last year. What a pity. I mean, you have to remind me of that. Oh, I know you love him in your own way. Okay, let's go beard pa. I mean father in his den. We went downstairs through the great echoey hall, wainscoted part way up, the rest rough plaster with a lot of gloomy people, ancestors I supposed, staring out of heavy carved gilt frames on the wall. The doors were all double ones, very high and heavy dark wood. At one of them, Abby stopped and knocked gently. Come. In you go, dear. Come with me. Oh, no. Much better alone. Try not to upset him. The door thudded shut like a cell door behind me. Across the room, to one side of the fireplace, half facing me as I entered, sat a man in a big wind chair. He was a large man, tall and heavy, with a huge beak of a nose and bristling eyebrows. Well, well, girl, are you going to stand at the door forever? Come over to me. Yes, father. I wanted to have a word or two with you alone before dinner. You realize Theo is still here? Oh, is he? Not the normal run of things, of course. Night before the wedding and all that, but uh, under the circumstances, uh, I mean, after today, uh, well, naturally. Uh, now, uh, <clears throat> sit down a moment. Y yes, Father. 
You're a headstrong little filly, you know. <laughs> like your mother, God rest her soul. The damn good portrait that fellow did, whatever his name was, caught that flash in her eye. Yes, Maureen. That was my mother's name. Of course it was, Marguerite. <laughs> it's what we're talking about. Yes, father. Now, <clears throat> to get down to cases, you had your, your fling today, and I must say it was personally embarrassing to me. And downright unreasonable. I hope that's over with. What fling, Father? Running off with that army chap. I'd have gone after you myself and stopped you if it hadn't been for this damnable gout. <coughs> Stop me from what? Oh, Lord knows. Even if it was marriage, as the boy apparently claimed, not a penny to his name, surely you can see for yourself what a mistake it would have been. Not your sort of chap at all. I hope you're properly grateful for Theo for interfering. I think that's just what he did. Then why should I be grateful? Easy there. One thought at a time. Theo is your fiancé. Your Edward, or whatever his name is, was lucky he didn't get hauled up for a summary court-martial. But maybe a couple of days in the guardhouse will cool the young puppy off. Supposing I preferred to marry Edward instead of Theo. I think we settled that between us. And you know perfectly well that Theo is a splendid marriage for you to make. And the only way to save my hide. You want to see your father ruined? I have no wish to bring anyone bad luck. Well, then you must allow me to run my family as is my place and right. You have no say in these matters. I'm afraid I will have to admit, in this case, that you are perfectly right, sir. <laughs> Splendid. Well, that's my girl. Now, <clears throat> let's get in to dinner and Theo. Only, I wasn't his girl. Which was exactly why I had to agree. And I really had no say about this family. I really couldn't worry for the moment about Marguerite. Wherever she was. My problem was myself. Peg Marshall. I needed help and I needed it bad. But where was it going to come from? Certainly not from the two men I dined with. Well, to your daughter, sir, and the lovely lady I am to marry within 24 hours. <laughs> well, I'll drink to that. <laughs> to the bride. Hmm. <coughs> Don't be alarmed, Marguerite. But you broke those beautiful crystal glasses. <laughs> That's part of the traditional toast of the bride. <laughs> Aren't you both ashamed to feel that... You may have to drag a woman to the altar. Oh, I don't think that will be necessary now. Surely your father will stand trustee for that. Then you can't trust him. Well, your father, I think I can answer for. Until that elusive bond is tied, however, I am naturally still somewhat tentative of you, my love. There was more to that interminable dinner. But it ended on the same note as it had begun. I did not learn much more of the whole situation by the end of it. Finally, the gentlemen retired to their port or brandy or whatever. And I was upstairs with Abby, ready to be put to bed by candlelight at the crazy hour of 9 p.m. Although I must say it was worth it to get out of that corset. Now, into bed. And I'll tuck you in cozy. Oh, I won't argue. Ooh, it's freezing. Oh, that lovely mattress. I am tired. Oh, only what am I going to do, oh, Abby? Hush, little one. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. That's a lot of help. Turn your back on the good book? Oh, for shame, Miss Marguerite. I won't turn my back on anything that might help. Remember what goes before, according to St. Matthew. Take, therefore, no thought for the morrow. 
for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Oh, Abby, you're such a dear person. You almost make me feel there's hope. Oh, place your trust in the Lord, and there's always hope. The combination of emotional exhaustion and that deep, downy bed and that sweet, loving old lady lulled me into accepting the situation. Before I knew it, I was asleep. Oh, I struggled back from layers deep, beckoned by a rooster somewhere, doing his thing. I hadn't heard one since I was a kid. And because he was far enough off, his raucous tone only brought me half awake. And suddenly, down beneath the window, all hell broke loose. By heavens, there he is, Wainwright. Where? Damn near inside the house. The nerve of the fellow. How'd he escape? Beyond me. Hold on there. You, Marshal, you're trespassing. Get off these grounds or I'll put a pistol ball through you. By God, that does it. Abby. Oh, the Lord preserve us. It's your young lieutenant come to try to steal you away like a crazy man. But where? How? I have to go to him. I went out from under the blankets to freezing cold. Abby threw some kind of robe over me as I rushed down to the lawn. Theo and the man who was supposed to be my father were there. Standing over the body of a young man dressed in colonial British uniform. He was quite dead, which was enough to shock me out of my mind. But what was even more horrendous was that the body lying dead in 1776 was the man I had married the day before, in 1976. girl torn from her own time, hurled back 200 years. This century, or two centuries ago, Margaret or Marguerite, what future does either or the same girl have? I shall return shortly with Act Three. a lovely moment all of us have known, that magic moment between sleep and waking, when half the enjoyment is knowing you are asleep and trying to stay that way. It can also be one of the most desolate moments in life, when in the same moment of suspended animation, you are fighting not to come awake, not to face the problem you don't want to remember or wake up to which is the moment Peg Marshall is going through this morning. Peg? Peg? I am so sorry, but wait for me. I will come to you. Together we must find a way to make it right. Lovey, what, what what is it? Oh, she, Marguerite, I, I think she was here. Who? Her, the real Marguerite. I, I saw her. She went out this way. Oh, child, child, control yourself. I tell you, she was here. She spoke to me and said she would come back. And she left by this window to... To what? Oh, I was going to say, out to the garden. 
Well, it's a sheer 20-foot drop down to the terrace below. How could anyone step out this window? They couldn't. Unless the person was... was a ghost. Oh, there are no such things. Oh, Abby, I know you're my friend. I wish I could explain so you'd understand. Oh, just try me. For whatever little I can do, I... I won't let you down. Oh, how can I? There's just no way you could know what I'm going through. I know. What can I say to you about... about last night? Last night? Oh, good Lord. Ted. They shot Ted. Hush, dear. Try to accept God's will. No. I want to see them. I want to see his murderers. Oh, that's a harsh word. He, he was a trespasser. And your father... Lord, forgive me for saying this. He's fighting for his own life, too. What do you mean? Loans he has made to these upstart colonials have put him in bad odor with the English bank. And I'm the negotiable factor in the whole rotten mess. For my father's honor, one body sold and delivered to Sir Theobald Bentley in full settlement of payment due. And I'm not the only body. Oh, hush, dear. These are not matters for a lady to concern herself with. You just help me get dressed so I can face up to my father and Theo. The past and maybe, just maybe what really belongs to me. The future. My dear Marguerite, it was neither your father nor I who brought things to a climax. It was your headstrong young suitor. How civilized you managed to sound. You're talking about a man you murdered. Oh, now I say, really. The beggar was trespassing. And he was an escaped jailbird. Oh, come on. Face the truth. Ted, the lieutenant hadn't committed any crime. Oh, that, of course, is a matter of opinion. Oh, no, Mr. Bentley. That was surely a matter of influence. Really, Marguerite? I see no point in pursuing this conversation. I guess I really don't either. No way we could ever reach an understanding. Oh, I'm afraid the understanding has already been reached. A marriage has been arranged and will be sanctified at five this evening. Or else. Supposing I told you to go shove your threats in your hat. Marguerite! In the Let me of... handle this, Wainwright. Am I to understand that you are threatening to refuse me as a husband, Marguerite? When you talk to me as Marguerite, I... I don't know. How else would he talk to you? Go to your room, daughter, and make yourself ready for the wedding. For by my soul, you will be at the altar if I have to drag you there in chains. Oh, that won't be necessary. I shall drive her myself to our wedding. And if she refuses, she knows what the consequences will be. Wainwright, I'll break you. <laughs> I was scared. I was no sooner in my room than the lock fell. Even Abby, it seemed, was to be denied me. And already, as if it was a threat, my wedding gown was laid out on the bed. I fell apart, head down on a chaise lounge, lost in tears. time left. Who is it? Where, where are you? It's Marguerite, Peg. Come here. Come quickly. Where? To the pier glass. The oval mirror. I crossed quickly to the old-fashioned mirror, expecting to see my own reflection. In a sense, I did. I saw myself. Every line in my face every curl in my hair, every familiar look of myself reflected, except that the figure in the glass was dressed, as I could see after a quick glance at the now empty bed, in the white silk gown and the long bridal veil that had been laid out for me to put on. I promised I would come. But so late. Too late. Not for you, I hope. And it long last... Not for me. Help me, Marguerite. What... What happened? 
That's beyond me. But everything else I can explain quickly. You know most of it by now. Yes, but... No, no, there's no time to waste. First, you must get out of your clothes and back into your modern ones. How could you know about them? I have been dead a long time, but not allowed to lie in the grave. Oh, quickly now, change, and I shall tell you. As you already know, my father was in financial difficulties. Sir Theobald was sent from England to close him out, to expose him to ruin and disgrace. As you have guessed, an accommodation was made between my father and Sir Theo. That old goat, that's the way I felt about him. Save... In my time, it was different. I did have a duty to my father. What do you mean, in your time? You're here now. Oh, you know that isn't so. What am I? A reflection in a dark glass. A wandering spirit that you may bring to rest. Me? How? I know very few answers. Why you are here? <laughs> An accident of time, and perhaps I have to believe that somehow we have common ancestors... The day before I was supposed to be married to Sir Theobald, I stole from the house and fled to meet Edward. We might have been married and happy if, if Theo hadn't found out from one of the grooms he had paid to spy on me. I can see the rest. The establishment rolled in and dragged you home. Yes. The next day, poor Edward made his foolish but wonderful attempt to rescue me. And got killed for his pains. But then what? What is about to happen to you? Theo drove me to the wedding, a pistol by his side. I was dressed as you see me in the mirror now. As we got to the covered bridge, just before we entered... Yeah? I pulled away from him and threw myself down into the stream. It's not so deep, but it is rocky, and I did what I wanted to do. I killed myself. You poor girl. And I've been doomed to wander all these years, unable to join my love, Edward. But now, I think at last, my time has come. How? With you. This time, if I kill myself, it will not be a sin because I can save you. Now, let's change places. I don't know what you mean. Me, in the wedding gown, looking into the mirror. You, in your modern jeans, looking out. As we ride to this wedding that never took place 200 years ago, we ride as one. But this time, it's my soul that will find escape. What about me? I don't know. It's a chance you'll have to take. But what better one do you face now? <laughs> that under thunderclouds and dark, scudding skies, Theo helped his bride to the two-horse carriage, unaware that with her, there was me, in blue jeans. Overhead, the skies were almost sitting on our heads, heavy with the promise of a storm. Well, my love, what with one thing and another, not the most auspicious occasion for our wedding... Or may I hope you will contradict me? Our fate is sealed. At least yours. You have achieved what you wanted to. Let us leave it at that. No, not quite. The ridiculous child love you had for the young pup who was uh, disposed of. I, um... I would like some guarantee that it will not come between us. Round the bend and down the hill is the, the covered bridge. Oh, oh yes, yes, that's right. For the time you reach it, I hope to answer your question forever. But why is it so dark? It's like a storm on the way. Hey, hip, the way. I hope we can reach the church before it breaks. There's the bridge. Now don't press against me. It's a narrow tunnel and I need room to maneuver. Look, at the opposite end, through the mist, those two enormous eyes. What are they? I, I don't know. I, I can't see. The... There's something coming towards us. We're going to crash. It's what you deserve. But not me. Not me. <laughs> Are you all right? What? I said, are you all right? Did we crash? Into what? Well, there was a horse and carriage coming the other way and... Come on, honey, you were out cold. You're dreaming. Am I? Are you sure? Well, sure I'm sure. 
The one thing I wish I was so sure of is where I'm at. I'm pretty low on gas. Well, we better find an open station soon. Yes, sir. You was just about empty. Good thing I stay open this late. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Oh, and uh, thanks for putting us on our way. Oh, that's no trouble, no trouble. One of the things I'm here for. Could I ask you something, sir? <laughs> I reckon I couldn't fuse the lady. You ever hear of some people called Drexel around here? Ah, no. Drexel is a right proper name, this part of the country. Goes back a couple of centuries or more. Old Manor House used to be here until shortly after the war. Then it became a hospital, like burned down a couple of years ago. Sad to see it go. Can you be a landmark, eh? Yeah, that's a funny thing. Come to think on it. What was that? Well, you... You must come over the covered bridge on your way here. Oh, yes. We sure did. Oh, a lot of excitement up there just after you came by. You might have the police car, ambulance and all. Why? What happened? Well, sir, they, they found a lady. Committed suicide, they say. All dressed up like colonial times in a long silk wedding dress and veil. Strange thing is, nobody knows where I should come from. Except in, uh... Except in what? Oh, well now, ain't nothing to put any belief in. But there is an old legend around these here parts about the white lady of the bridge. Misty night, she's supposed to haunt that old covered wreck. <laughs> well, who knows? Maybe now they'll fix that old bridge up. And another New Hampshire ghost will be laid to rest. Another New Hampshire ghost. Certainly not for Peg Marshall. In a long and happy marriage to Ted Marshall, it is perhaps the one thing she never could quite share with him. Oh, of course, she's told him the story, but... He just laughs it off because she was sound asleep when they entered that covered bridge and didn't wake up till they came out the other side. What happened in between? For Ted, nothing. For Peg, a nightmare. But then, in a moment of dreaming, anyone can live a lifetime. I'll be back shortly. Many years later that Peg Marshall discovered, almost accidentally, that a long-dead ancestor was named Lady Exeter, who happened to be the sister of Marguerite Drexel. But by the time Peg found that out, she was too happily established as a mother and too infinitely wise to speculate on that old chance family tie. As for Marguerite, one can only hope that somewhere... She rests in peace. Our cast included Jada Rowland, Bob Caliban, Ian Martin, and Bryna Rayburn. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. If we leave by that door, we won't be seen. Coming? I'm not sure. Afraid? Uh, of what I can see, hear, and touch? No. Take my hand. It is real, is it not? Alive, warm. Yes. Look into my eyes and tell me what you see. Who are you, Tara? Did my friend Carl von Linden ever truly know? I know of no Carl von Linden. There is a painting in his apartment, a portrait of a face he has seen many times in a dream. <laughs> Surely not me. Perhaps not. <laughs> But one thing I do know for sure, the death of von Linden was an unnatural occurrence. I promise you his murder will not go unpunished. And those who have done the devil's bidding will spend an eternity in hell. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by all state insurance companies and Sinoff, the sinus medicines. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time...
Pleasant dreams? I hope you enjoyed this episode of CBS Radio Mystery Theater. If you enjoyed this and want to hear more, please subscribe to this channel.